I have the pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Josh Friedman, who's joining us from California. He's probably wondering why he's here today uh, due to the weather, but uh, Josh um, is the co-founder, co-chairman, and co-chief executive officer of Canyon Partners. It's a global uh, leading asset management firm headquartered in uh, Los Angeles, California, graduate of uh, Harvard College, Oxford University, Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School. Prior to uh, forming Canyon, Mr. Uh, Friedman was Director of Capital Markets for High Yield and uh, Private Placements at Drexel, Byrd and Lampert. And prior to that, he was with Goldman Sachs in their mergers and uh, acquisitions um, department. Uh, Josh is also the trustee of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. He also chairs the Finance and Investment Committee of the California Institute of Technology, Caltech where he chairs the investment committee, um, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and the US UCLA Hospital for Neurosurgery. He also uh, serves on the board of the committee of the Broad Foundations. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to bring out Josh. I'm not sure where he's sitting, so if he wants to come up, that'd be great. Oh, in the back. Thank you. I tried to go pay for it. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I want to thank Prime Quadrant and Baycrest and also thank Mo. Mo, as you can see, is a tough taskmaster. He's given me a minute-by-minute -minute chronology of what I'm supposed to discuss here. Um, but like Byron, I've reached that point in life where I'm fundamentally uncoachable, so I'll do my best. Um, let's see. So today, are we in a bubble? We're going to talk about U.S. credit and a little bit about global credit, particularly corporate credit and to some extent real estate credit. Um, are we in a bubble situation? This is a little, a little cartoon, the House of Cards. As you can see, this is our most popular financial model here. Um, quick bit of background so you understand the point of view that I bring to the table where I, where I come from. Canyon is a 25-year-old firm that I started with my old roommate from graduate school. Um, we're really oriented toward institutions of all sorts, from family offices to sovereign wealth funds to pension funds, corporate and public, as well as foundations and endowments. And most of our $25 billion of capital is structured as a hedge fund. We try to be an absolute return-oriented player. Uh, we have about 240 employees spread out, mostly in LA, but a lot in New York and a lot in London. And we while I don't think of ourselves as a credit manager, per se, because we don't particularly like credit instruments right now, at least conventional credit instruments, we do look at the world from the point of view of a creditor. So we look at asset values. We look at cash flows. We think of ourselves as value investors. And unlike most hedge funds, we run our funds without any leverage. So we need to find things that have attractive, absolute levels of return, and hopefully a good deal less volatility than what you find in the public markets in equity. Um, the last five years, as you can see, have been a particularly exciting time for us with high returns, but we're in a lower, a lower return environment now, and one where we've pulled in our horns a great deal. And I'll talk to you a little bit about where we see risk and where we see potential opportunities. You've seen uh, this chart before. This is the growth of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. It's been uh, unprecedented in terms of the bank intervention in the market. This is buoyed credit markets everywhere and kept interest rates very low. And although quantitative easing has ended in the United States, um, we don't try to opine on interest rates. But my own point of view, and you, ha you, have, to, you have to, as Dan Ock says, you, if you don't do macro, macro will do you. you. You have to at least think about what the backdrop is for interest rates whenever you're thinking about engaging in any transaction that involves valuing securities, whether it's equities or debt. And as, as Byron pointed out earlier, low interest rates keep equity values high. They also keep bond values high. And that can be somewhat treacherous. But I guess what I would say is notwithstanding the comments that we hear um, about the Fed imminently raising rates, I'd say there's a lot of pressure not to raise rates in the United States. And this is the first one. Janet Yellen cares a lot about employment. As you can see, um, the participation rate in the US in the employment pool is drastically below that of Europe, notwithstanding our low unemployment. So are we willing to raise rates and take a chance that that drops even lower? 
In addition, uh, let me go back. Um, in addition, there are a lot of other reasons why I believe that it's going to be a little tougher to raise rates in the near term. We have record levels of federal debt, which have to be serviced. And when you raise the rates, we know what that does to current account deficits. Uh, we have exchange rate strains. The United States dollar has gotten a lot stronger, which is very unfavorable to exports. We have clear competitive easing going on, both in Asia and in the ECB. And we have signs of some slowing down in China, as well as tensions in various hot spots around the world. So when you add that all together, it says to me that while I don't really think rates, I don't really think rates are necessarily going up in the near term. On the other hand, the absolute level of rates, is are, those levels are quite low in a variety of markets. So the cost of getting that wrong is high. So from our own perspective, we're not trying to make bets based on long duration bonds. We're not trying to make bets on the high yield market. We view all those yields as fundamentally relatively low compared to historical levels and vulnerable to sudden adjustments if you get the timing of rate adjustments wrong. When you keep rates low for a long time, people start taking more and more and more debt on, and they start taking more and more risk on. As you can see in this chart, the leveraged debt markets have grown substantially since 2008. And while they closed up shop briefly in terms of new issuance, you can see that right now those leveraged debt markets are up approximately 75% in size in the last five years. The leveraged loan market itself, just bank loans to leverage credits, that's about an $800 billion market. And the high yield bond market is about a billion six today. So these markets have grown a lot. And in this competitive desire of everyone to earn yield, people seem to be willing to step out further and further and further on the risk curve. Uh, let's see, that looks like not this, that's, this is the slide I wanted. Um, in 2014, two thirds of all the first, yield lever first lien leverage loans that were issued have been covenant light. So basically, the, the financial covenants don't exist. That's a rough bet if you're going to try to buy those securities. Because at the first opportunity, companies re-leverage. They make acquisitions. They do other things. You have no possibility of ever having your security appreciate if the issuer constantly has no penalty associated with re-leveraging his credit. So improving credits rarely exist in the covenant light world. Meanwhile, if you look in the bond market, the amount of issuance of triple C paper or non-rated debt, which is even below triple C, has skyrocketed. And you can see that in the second chart, where uh, last year there were 41 billion of paper issued, and this year it's already at 29. So this creates a lot more downside potential than there is upside. If you look at the prices of high yield bonds and leveraged loans, you have to remember what happened in 2008. And while our financial system isn't in a state of le high leverage and imminent danger the way it was in 2008, first lien bank debt of high quality companies all dropped from basically par or 90 cents on the dollar to levels in the 60s, and then went back to par the year after. So there are things that, other than fundamental credit characteristics, that drive the price of securities. You have to look at liquidity providers. You have to look at the banking system. You have to look at who's leveraged and who's a buyer, and why are they buying and why are they selling. And it's tough to be a buyer, in our opinion, of relatively simple to understand securities when the prices are so high as they are in the debt markets today. You can see on the right part of that chart that if you buy plain vanilla high yield bonds, the yield to worst today is within 80 basis points of an all time low yield. So basically you're buying junior subordinated debt that sits underneath a record high mountain of bank debt and you're earning a little over 5% before adjusting for the average level of defaults that might take place and cause you to lose money on a few of those securities. That's just not that interesting to us, at least in our structure. This gets to the second point of liquidity. Um, under the Volcker rule, under the rules of Basel III, et cetera, financial institutions globally have really been forced not only to deleverage, but to really pull their horns in, in terms of use of capital to support capital markets. So on the top chart, you can see that the high yield bond market has grown from about $800 million to a billion three. Meanwhile, the amount of inventory from the reporting banks to the Fed 
that is held by Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and all the other reporting institutions has dropped precipitously. Under the Volcker rules, they simply can't be principles the same way they were in the past. So today, the high yield market is about 34 times the size of the dealer inventory. And it was kind of interesting to see what happened this last October. You saw a real shock hit a lot of people in the hedge fund world. And not only people in the hedge fund world, but people in traditional management roles as well, with more traditional vehicles. Um, Wall Street was holding about $8 billion of, of high yield paper at the beginning of October, and they dropped that to $2 billion within two weeks. So basically, there is very little market making function going on in Wall Street. By the way, that's an opportunity for players who have no leverage and who have capital. The spreads in that market don't go away. In fact, they probably get wider. But it means the banks are not the places that are performing that market making function. It means there are buyers like us who are less concerned about an investment bank running in and buying at a certain price, holding it, and then marking up. We can bid down and then own things. So trading is something that is now becoming more dispersed amongst different kinds of players. Fixed income yields globally for uh, investment grade and for, sovereign, uh, for sovereigns are also quite low. These are all numbers I'm sure you're pretty familiar with. You can see that we're not quite at the all-time low yields in the US or Canada, but we're awfully close in Germany, just a few weeks away from where they hit their low in, in the middle of October. Um, even companies like Spain, Italy, and Portugal, which are hardly nations that you think of as being out of the woods financially, we've heard a lot about the softening in Europe, and that's where the softening is taking place, um, have, have, are, taking, uh, are having extraordinarily low interest rates associated with their sovereign debt. Greece is the outlier at 8%, given the political issues that it's facing in the short run. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see that rate tight, tighten as well. If you look at the investment grade index, you can see it's 298 versus 248, the all-time low, and the high yield index is also within 50 basis points or so of its all-time low. And the, and the leverage loan index for bank debt, much of which is covenant light, uh, is within three basis points of its all-time low. So basically, bond markets are close to their all-time high. That doesn't mean that they're overvalued, but it's cautionary. And for us, it means that traditional fixed income instruments, traditional credit instruments, are not of great interest to us. The, the difficulty, of course, is that none of the markets that we look at appears to be wildly cheap. Maybe the equity markets are a little cheap relative to interest rates, not clear. As you can see, the uh, S&P is basically at an all-time high. The Dow is basically at an all-time high. The NASDAQ is at an all-time high. And the Russell is within spitting dis distance of an all-time high. So how do we use the credit markets to build a little better mousetrap? How can we use um, our structure as a hedge fund, which is quite different from the structure of a traditional money manager, how can we use the strengths that that structure give us in order to achieve better risk-adjusted returns than you can get buying traditional credit instruments or traditional equities? So let me talk about that structure a little bit because it really drives everything. Structure determines behavior. If you're a 40-act fund and you're in the high-yield business, you will invest as soon as you get cash put in your fund and you will invest in high-yield because that's your mandate. If you're a small cap equity uh, uh, fund, you will invest when you get cash put in your fund. You will also sell when you get cash taken out of your fund. These are very benchmarked, mandate-restricted pools of capital. Most investment capital in the world is, men is benchmarked and is mandate-restricted. We have the luxury as a hedge fund of being multi-strategy. We can hold cash or we can leverage. We tend not to leverage, but we do hold cash a lot. And we try to wait for disruptive moments in the market, such as in October, or worse, to try to put that capital to work. We also have the privilege of putting our money in multiple asset classes. So if we can maintain enough expertise in different areas of the market, it lets us be opportunistic about where we put that money to work. We can also short securities as well as go long securities. But examples of being opportunistic this way uh, would be looking at the rolling state of restructurings in the United States. The bank debt business was terribly depressed following 08. That proved to be a great entry point for that market. In 2011, the mortgage market collapsed as the US government was eager to sell all of the subprime RMBS, residential mortgage-backed securities, that it took over through the process of the, of, of, of the financial crisis. 
And when the government was, was, was uh, selling all of that paper into the market, the prices dropped 30% or so. Um, so having the flexibility to wait for moments of, of, of disruption is very, very important. Even in a market where there are relatively few of them, there's always something that's in a state of disequilibrium. Uh, optimal positioning, basically what that means is that we have the opportunity um, to be either fully invested or 50% invested or 70% invested at our choice. We're not a benchmarked fund, so we don't, have to we don't have to operate with those constraints. We also have much longer duration capital. Our investors essentially have quarterly liquidity, but they can take it out 25% per quarter. That's a, that lets us do a lot of things that can't be done by a 40-act fund that has daily liquidity requirements. And we're also able to develop specialized skill sets. There are lots of um, funds that are excellent at doing very specialized things within the capital markets. And occasionally, it's a really good idea to put money with a specialist in some niche when that niche is particularly attractive. The big problem today is that many funds are so specialized, yet the market in which they're operating goes from being attractive to unattractive overnight. Capital comes in, prices go up, and then you've got your money in a specialized fund that's usually the last one to tell you that that specialization is no longer that interesting. So our goal is to try to have a lot of different skill sets and hopefully find something exciting and interesting to do across the credit markets, even when the, the average prices are quite high. This gives you a little sense of, of what we're trying to do with our capital today. You can see that the fixed income securities that we own have an average dollar price of about 53 cents on the dollar versus the high yield index of 102. So this is not a high yield fund. This is a distressed collection of assets in the fixed income category. You could even say it's like equity because when you buy debt at 50 cents on the dollar, you don't really do it with an expectation that the borrower is going to pay you back. So when we buy things in the secondary market, we've tried to focus on niches within the distressed world where we think we're going to get a high recovery, but we're not planning on getting par. And if you look at the loans we own, the average price is 71 cents on the dollar versus the leverage loan index at 99 cents on the dollar. Again, very different pattern of risk drivers. Much, much less correlation to interest rates, much, much less correlation to overall debt markets. As the banks have suffered with all of the restrictions we've talked about, there's been, there are other institutions that come in to fill the void, and that's what shadow banking is. Shadow banking has picked up um, a 12% rate in the last couple of years, last few years compared to 5% for banks. What is shadow banking? Shadow banking refers to non-regulated, non-banking institutions that don't take deposits, that don't have insurance, that aren't levered like banks, and there are all manner of funds that participate in shadow banking that can either hold loans, make loans, trade securities, et cetera. But they don't present the same risks as a highly regulated, highly leveraged deposit-taking institution. And in many, many cases in the capital markets today, banks have taken a step back. They're either selling troubled assets on their balance sheets, they're failing to provide trading markets because the capital costs are too high, or they're not providing loans where they used to. We heard about Bernanke having difficulty finding a loan. Go try finding a non-recourse construction loan on your real estate project today, even if you put 40% equity into it and it's a layup from a credit point of view. You get rejected at the door with a checkoff by most banks today. So this provides an opportunity for people like us to step in occasionally and provide relatively short duration opportunistic financing at higher rates. The regulations that are causing this to take place are pretty clear. There are capital requirements under the Basel requirements in Europe or under Dodd-Frank. Um, there's the Volcker rule, which restricts balance sheets. There are leverage restrictions that the Fed is putting on commercial banks. And there are risk retention rules as well. The bottom line is this web of, of, of rules um, makes it, make, creates opportunities for alternative participants in the credit markets. Um, it is common for people in my business to think they're really smart and say, oh boy, is that bank stupid to sell me this piece of paper at 50 cents on the dollar? Oh boy, is that 40 act fund foolish to sell me this at this price? Generally speaking, I find that you make almost no money being smarter than the next guy. Everyone is smart in this business. 
You're smart, your competitors are smart, the dealers are smart. But we all face different rules and different constraints. The poor bank in Europe that is forced to offload all of its troubled assets is not at, at relatively lousy prices, is not doing that because he's foolish. He's doing it because the capital charges are enormous for him to hold that paper going forward. His behavior is completely rational given the rules that he faces. The poor trader at, uh, you name the investment bank, that unloaded paper to us during the middle of October did it because he had to do it, not because he wanted to do it. So let's talk about what that means in terms of opportunities. Opportunity number one is European bank debt. European banks are different from US banks. In US bank debt, very little of it's actually owned by banks. It's owned by dozens of funds, by CLOs, by bank debt uh, vehicles, by hedge funds, by others. So when a company gets in trouble and a bank wants to offload its loan in the US, there's a ready-made market of dozens of other players who already know the credit and are happy to bid. But in Europe, bank debt is still closely held by a very tight syndicate of banks or even maybe by one bilateral bank. So the credits aren't well known. The blocks that trade are large, 50 to $500 million. So it's really a much smaller game. It's a game where there's a smaller handful of larger institutions who have a chance to bid at discounts on all of the assets that are being restructured and sold by Irish banks, Spanish banks, French banks, and British banks, and German banks. So that's opportunity number one. Um, if you look at this little chart here, you can see the volume of asset, bank, of asset sales by European banks. Uh, there's still 2.4 trillion of non-core assets remaining on the balance sheets of these banks. Many of them are real estate loans. So notwithstanding the weakening of the markets in Europe, there's a lot of opportunity there. This is a little graph of just our own exposure. You can see from the little red line that goes up, the, the blue line is our exposure on the long side in bank debt. The bottom line, on the, the gray line below the surface is our short position. That's really hedging those positions. We pretty much stopped doing that after Draghi put a safety net under everyone. Um, and sovereign risk became less of an issue, at least for the moment. And the red line is our gross purchases. And you can see we bought over $5 billion of paper in Europe. It's a competitive market. There are very strong, big players there who we compete with, but there's a relatively small number of them. And they're all somewhat like-minded. They're all people who are seeking relatively high returns. They're all funds like us that frankly are high fee vehicles and therefore require a higher return in order to produce good risk adjusted returns net net to their investors. So it's a whole different game from fighting with all of the little credit seekers in the US high yield market. So that's the first opportunity. Um, the second opportunity I'd say, uh, let me come back to this one in a minute, is, is special situation lending. Um, I mentioned this briefly. If you look at a construction loan today or you look at a loan to someone who's gone bankrupt or a company that's gone bankrupt, construction loans, et cetera, you can do loans that are 60% loan to value. They are difficult to source. And what you're really getting paid for is the sourcing and the structuring of the deals, not really the credit risk. So that's a second area where our firm is very focused these days. The third area is sort of an old, an old song, which is this one. And this is too busy, so I won't urge you to look at this. But this is kind of an oldie but goodie, which is the residential mortgage-backed business in the US. This is um, basically a, a trillion dollar market. Um, double line is excellent at this market as well. Um, they're quite a bit larger than us. Uh, there are people like PIMCO and BlackRock and WAMCO. But then you have boutique players like us who are smaller, can be very selective on what we buy because our portfolio is smaller. And we don't have a need to be in the asset class if we can't find things that we love. But this is an area where there's been a great deal of recovery in the assets. Most of the worst loans have already either been restructured or they've already defaulted and are no longer in these vehicles. So if you look down the column that says October, four, October 2014, it says percentage of pool with po positive equity, you can see we've gone from 34% of the underlying mortgages in these subprime pools being um, underwater to now 73%, or sorry, we've gone from 34% being um, positive equity loans, in other words, ones where the borrower still had equity in the house, to being 73% positive equity loans. So we've had massive credit improvement in this market. 
Um, it's very hard to source new product in this market, although when you get a, a jolt in the market like October, suddenly you can make some purchases. But this is an area where the yields are hundreds of basis points higher than the high yield market, Hun probably 350 to 400 basis points higher. And there's a potential for significant price appreciation. High yield bonds trade at over par, so they don't really have any ability to go up. If rates go down, if good things happen in the credit, you get refinanced out and you don't get a premium. But this paper trades at 61 cents on the dollar. So as yields tighten, as people understand the improving quality, we get the ability to sell these at substantial premiums. We're also starting to see cracks in the traditional US distressed debt market. My own conclusion is that patients will be rewarded here and that we may have another year or two or maybe two and a half or three, but probably less. And we've, we've just made some new purchases in the distressed market for the first time in a number of years here. Um, October saw some real cracks. Radio Shack bonds went down, Sears bank debt dropped, Jimboree bonds dropped, Guitar Center dropped, um, JC Penney dropped, Exide dropped. The problem is all these companies have one thing in common. They're not very good companies. And <laughs> this is a problem. It's, it's hard to understand, frankly, why Radio Shack exists at this point. If you look at Jimboree, which sells children's clothing, You've had Jimboree and William Carter together increase the number of stores selling children's clothing by 20% in the last few years, while the market stayed flat and Amazon's taking piece of the market, as, as is every other mail order retailer. So that's not a good equation. But this is usually the canary in the coal mine that ha occurs before you start getting more opportunity. And in the meantime, what we need to do is hide out in these other areas, such as European paper, such as the distressed mortgages, and such as the direct lending business. This is a list of opportunities I will not go over. Um, I'd rather just uh, mention one of these, which is corporate balance sheets in, tr in transition. The flip side of having a bull market for credit where rates are low, and the flip side of a high stock price market is that a lot of deals happen. There's a lot of M&A which means some company that used to be a junk credit gets bought by an investment grade credit and the bonds go up 20 points. Or some high grade company gets bought by a junk company, the Safeway, for example, getting, getting bought by Albertsons, and the bonds drop 20 points. This creates tremendous volatility in bond prices as well as stock prices, which is interesting. Um, with that, I'm gonna just say the, the, game, the game for us, whoops, is that not moving? Um, any way to get that thing to move forward? Sorry? Ah, there we go. Is to try to capture as much of the upside as we can and as little of the downside. So I return now to my house of cards analogy, except I'm having trouble with the screen. Ah, there we go. I wanted to have a picture of Frank Underwood from House of Cards here, but our compliance people said we didn't have the right copyright. But um, I have two quotes here. One, it's not the beginning of the story that I fear it's not, it's, it's, it's not knowing how it will end. We have a lot of mystery going on in the high yield market right now. And we know that some of it's not going to end well, but we don't know exactly a how. So we want to take a step back and be careful while that's happening. And the other one is pay attention to the fine print. It's more important than the selling price. You've got to read covenants. You've got to do all that little detailed work or you'll really put yourself at risk. Thank you.